Hello, everyone. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah, and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then every Thursday on YouTube. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are discussing the case of Nicholas Barclay. And this is one of the most twisted cases I have heard in a while, simply because by the end of it, you are going to be so confused. And it leaves you with a lot more questions than answers, definitely about what actually happened in this case. And you'll understand what I mean more so when we get to the end of it. And I'm going to have some questions for you guys as well, just because I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say about it. I'm not so sure where I land on this case, but I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about it. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Nicholas was born on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1980, to his single mother, Beverly Dollarhide. And he also has two older siblings, Carrie and Jason. The family lived in San Antonio, Texas, and growing up, Nicholas definitely pushed limits and was very rebellious. His older siblings, Carrie and Jason, were from his mother's previous marriage. And so because of that, there was a very large age gap between Nicholas and his older siblings. So a lot of times he felt like he was kind of on his own. He didn't have a lot of family to hang out with. His siblings weren't necessarily at the age anymore where they wanted to be hanging out with their younger brother who was significantly younger than them. And along with that, his mother Beverly worked graveyard shifts at a local convenience store. So she would be gone all throughout the night. And then during the day, she would take that time to sleep. So Nicholas wasn't very heavily supervised growing up. At 13 years old, Nicholas had already had a pretty heavy juvenile criminal record that consisted of charges of breaking and entering, as well as stealing and truancy. And his mother said that growing up, it was almost near impossible to discipline Nicholas. He was very street smart, and for being only 13 years old, he acted a lot older than he was, partially because he wasn't heavily supervised, so he was going out and kind of experiencing the real world, so to speak and was learning things as he went. For example, at 13 years old, Nicholas already had three tattoos which is not something that's very common at the age of 13. He had the letter J tattooed on his left shoulder. He had the letter T on his left hand in between his thumb and his forefinger. And he also had the letters L and N on his outer ankle. Now, anytime Beverly would try to discipline Nicholas, Nicholas would lash out by either running away or he would become verbally abusive towards his mother. He even sometimes would try and physically hurt her. And so because of that, Beverly reached out to her oldest son, Jason, and asked Jason if he would move back in with Beverly and Nicholas to try and give Nicholas some sort of a male figure in his life. Nicholas never knew his biological father. He didn't have a stepfather. There was no one in that male role for him, that father figure role. So Beverly turned to Jason and Jason was in his 20s at the time. So he was older, but he did agree to move back in with Beverly. But Jason himself wasn't even the best influence on Nicholas. Jason had a pretty hefty drug addiction and he also had a pretty violent temper, which is never a good combination. And the police were very familiar with the Barclay household. They were constantly visiting that home for domestic domestic disturbance calls, which should give you an idea of the type of environment that Nicholas was in. And along with that, Nicholas, as I mentioned earlier, would run away pretty frequently. He had a tendency to run away from home quite a bit, but whenever he did run away from home, he always came back within the next day or two. He never left for an extended period of time. Now, because of all of his run-ins with the law at such a young age, Nicholas was actually scheduled to have a court appearance on June 14th, 1994. Now, this specific court appearance was going to focus on Nicholas being transferred to a group home to basically help get his act together, help straighten him out, give him more supervision and structure and all of those things that he desperately needed. I think a lot of people saw Nicholas acting out as almost like a cry for help because he had no other way to express that he needed that. He needed structure. He needed stability. And his home situation just wasn't providing him 
with that. But as you can imagine at 13 years old, being told that you were going to move into a group home to essentially get your act together, you're going to be under a lot stricter rules and more supervision. That did not sit well with Nicholas. The idea that he was going to lose all of his freedom was not something that he was okay with whatsoever. So now we move on to June 13th, 1994. And this was one day before Nicholas's court appearance was scheduled. Nicholas was last seen wearing a white t-shirt shirt, purple pants, and black sneakers, and he was also carrying a pink backpack. At the time he went missing, he stood at about four foot eight and weighed around 80 pounds. Now, June 13th started out as any normal day. Nicholas had gone out to the local park that was approximately one to two miles from his home to play basketball with some of his friends. Now, Beverly had given Nicholas $5 when he left to go play basketball and told him to just be back before dinner. And going and playing basketball at the park was something that Nicholas did quite frequently. This wasn't something that was a random occurrence for him. He seemed completely fine when he went. Now, Nicholas had walked from his house to the basketball court. And the reason that we know he got to the basketball court is because after the game was finished, Nicholas did call his house and Jason answered. And Nicholas asked Jason if Jason could come and pick him up from the basketball court and bring him home. That way he wouldn't have to walk back again. Now, according to Jason, he told Nicholas, that their mom was sleeping in the living room and Jason didn't want to wake her up. So he told Nicholas to walk home. Now, Nicholas wasn't necessarily thrilled about this, but he said okay and that he was going to make the walk back. But little did Jason know when he hung up the phone, that would be the last time he would speak to Nicholas. Now, after a couple hours had passed and it had gotten dark outside and Nicholas still wasn't home, Beverly said she started to get extremely worried. Jason ended up telling his mom that he told Nicholas to walk home from the basketball court. And this made Beverly very concerned because she knew that Nicholas should have been back at this point. He only had $5 in his pocket and he said he would be home before dinner. So because of that, Beverly ended up calling the police to file a missing persons report. But with this, the police kind of felt like they were at a standstill because they knew Nicholas had a very big reputation for constantly running away. Him running away was nothing out of the ordinary. And they knew that he always came back within 24 to 48 hours. So they figured that that is what would happen again this time. Along with that, they also thought that the timing of this runaway, quote unquote, was very very convenient considering that Nicholas's court date was the following day and they knew how much he did not want to go to that court date. So they figured that this was probably his way of trying to get out of it. However, after several days passed and Nicholas still hadn't returned home, it started to sink into everyone that this could be a lot more serious than Nicholas just running away. Now, here's when things get a little confusing. Three months after Nicholas had gone missing, on September 25th, 1994, Jason had ended up calling the police one night after he swore that he saw Nicholas trying to break into their garage. Now, at this point, Jason still was living at home with his mother, Beverly, so they still were residing in the family home. So Jason called the police and said that he thinks that Nicholas was trying to break into the garage, and then the second that Nicholas saw Jason, Nicholas ran away. Now, because of this, police showed up to the house. They did a search through the house and they also did a search through the neighborhood and they couldn't find any sign of Nicholas at all. There was no sign of a break in. There was no sign of anything being destroyed or tampered with. So police really couldn't consider this a valid sighting. And not only that, to this day, both Beverly and the police think that Jason did not see Nicholas this night, which leads to the question of what did he see and why did he think he saw Nicholas? Because if you think about it, it is pretty random and just a little out of the blue for Nicholas to try and break into his own family's garage. And then once he sees his brother, he decides to run away again. That part doesn't really make a lot of sense because if he is coming home, why would he run away again if he's being seen? I know it sounds confusing and it's because it is confusing. That sighting does not really make a lot of sense and it's part of the reason why it wasn't considered a valid sighting. So we don't really know what Jason saw that night, but what we do know is that days of Nicholas being missing turned into weeks, which turned into months, and months turned into years, and there was still no sign of Nicholas. 
Nicholas. Now, throughout all of this, Beverly and Nicholas's siblings were really holding out hope that Nicholas would return home. However, they knew the probability of that happening at this point was kind of slim to none, just because the likelihood of a child going missing and coming back alive after years is very slim. That's a very slim percentage. And another big question was what happened? No one could figure it out. Was it that Nicholas did run away because he was trying to escape his court date and then ran into the wrong person? Or was it that someone snatched Nicholas on his walk home? Because if you remember, he did ask his brother Jason to drive him home. So he had the plan of going home in his mind to begin with. So was it that he did get snatched on his way home? The possibilities for this were really endless. However, everything changed in October. 1997. Before we move on, we're going to take a second to talk about today's sponsors. Now, I love this time of the year, but I absolutely hate the pressure that comes with finding the perfect gift. I don't know about you guys, but I have very young nieces and nephews, and trying to pick out what to give them is always a struggle because they forget about it almost as soon as they get it. So this year, I'm giving them a gift to last a lifetime, the gift of learning without school. OutSchool offers the largest variety of live interactive online classes for kids pre-K through high school. And the classes, you guys, are actually fun and cover every interest you can think of, and some you even can't. They even have video game design, cartoon animation, playing an instrument, speaking a language, creative writing, and so much more. And the classes are super affordable. You can choose the size and group that works best for your child, giving them the experience that's best for them. OutSchool even has one-on-one classes. Classes bring kids together around their shared passion and interests, helping them fall in love with learning, making real connections and friends. I have young nieces and nephews. And like I said, this is what they're getting this year from me. And I cannot wait just because OutSchool has so many different options for them and they will be able to use this for years to come. I'm giving a gift that's going to last a lifetime and you can too. To learn more about all OutSchool has to offer and to save $15 off your child's first class, go to outschool.com slash instinct and use the code instinct. That's code instinct at O-U-T-S-C-H-O-O-L dot com slash instinct to save $15 off your child's first class. Outschool.com slash instinct. Okay, guys, let's talk stamps.com. If you are looking for ways to skip the trips to the post office and dodge all the hectic holiday shopping traffic, why not save time and money with Stamps.com. Stamps.com lets you compare rates, print labels, and access exclusive discounts on UPS and USPS services all year long. It just makes sense, especially if your business sends more mail and packages during the holidays. I am absolutely a mad woman during this time of year. It is a crazy time for work and just getting everything in order for the holidays. And Stamps.com has saved me so much time, money, and I can't even stress this one enough, stress. It has saved me so much stress during the holidays. You can get discounts that you can't find anywhere else, like 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS. Going to the post office instead of using stamps.com is kind of like taking the stairs instead of the elevator, let's be honest. Save time and money this holiday season with stamps.com. Sign up with promo code KILLER for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale, and there is no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page and enter the code KILLER. Now, one of my favorite things ever is exploring new wines, but I am not always sure what to get, and I really don't like being disappointed, which is why I love First Leaf Wine Club. They remove all the guesswork, doing all the hard work for me, so they discover the great wines, and I just enjoy them. First Leaf winemakers sample 10,000 wines a year across five continents and 12 countries and select only the best bottles for their club. First Leaf believes wine is personal. They create a custom wine print for each each member and map their vast portfolio of wines to each person's unique taste preferences once you take their five-minute quiz. The more wines you rate, the more each shipment is personalized to your taste. Now, there are no contracts or cancellation fees, and if you're not happy with the wine you receive, First Leaf will give you a credit towards your next shipment for a risk-free way to explore an endless array of world-class wine. I don't think I've ever shared with you guys how much I love wine. To me, there is nothing better after a long day to just sit back on the couch with a glass 
glass of wine. And I love that First Leaf. It makes it so easily accessible for me to try so many different wines that I have fallen in love with. I think wine is great for all occasions. I don't think you ever need an excuse for wine. And I think you guys should celebrate your firsts and the moments that count with First Leaf. The wine club designed to help you discover new wines you'll love, personalized to your taste and delivered to your door. Join today and you'll get six bottles of wine for $29.95 with free shipping. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash killer. That's try, T-R-Y, firstleaf.com slash killer for six bottles of wine for $29.95 with free shipping. Here's a toast to firsts. May you enjoy them with the people that you love from the first sip to the last. Tryfirstleaf.com slash killer. Have you guys ever thought of why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam to get money out of you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need want, or simply just forgot about. On average, you guys, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions so hard and painful to cancel, Truebill makes the process incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will be able to cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. You guys, Truebill has saved me and my entire family so much money. We used to have to have sit-down meetings once every couple months just to see what unwanted subscriptions we were still subscribed for and paying for. And Truebill has taken that process away and made it so much easier. We actually saved about $650 with Truebill. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at truebill.com slash killer. Go right now at truebill.com slash killer. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash killer. On October 7th, 1997, authorities in Spain had received a phone call from a citizen who said that he had seen a boy around 14 to 15 years old who looked really scared, looked like he had run away from something. He was hiding from people. He wouldn't talk to anyone. And when offered food, he refused it. Just overall seemed like a very nervous person and someone that had just escaped from a bad situation. So the witness had asked if authorities could come and pick this boy up and see what was going on, which they did. After authorities had picked the boy up, they took him back to the police station where for hours they tried to question him. However, he wouldn't say anything. Authorities could definitely tell that the boy was nervous. He wasn't speaking. He felt very uncomfortable. And so because of that, they kind of gave him a little bit of leniency, knowing that something really bad had just happened to him. So they tried to make him as comfortable as possible until ultimately the boy spoke. The boy had told police that his name was Nicholas Barclay and that he went missing from the United States. And he also told them that he had been in a child sex trafficking ring, and that was why he was in Spain. Now, once authorities got wind of this, they completely jumped on it, obviously, and called the police station in San Antonio, Texas. After authorities in San Antonio got word of it, they ended up reaching out to Beverly. Now, when the San Antonio police called Beverly, she was actually at work at the time and didn't answer her phone, and so they had to leave her a voice message. The voice message essentially said that the police from Spain were trying to get in contact with her because they believe they found Nicholas. Once she got the message, she immediately called them back, and that is when she was given a little bit more detail and was told that Nicholas was kidnapped by high-ranking government officials and was being involved in a sex trafficking ring in Spain. Now, they also informed her that due to the experiences that Nicholas had gone through in the three years that he had been missing, he might seem unrecognizable to her. Prior to him going missing, Nicholas had blue eyes and light blonde hair, but she was informed that his abductors had ran experiments on him that caused his blue eyes to turn brown, and they also dyed his hair a darker 
color. But regardless of that, they said that Nicholas did have the same tattoos that he had when he had gone missing, which was a big distinguishing factor for people to believe that this actually was Nicholas and to confirm that for everyone. And honestly, at this point, no one really cared what Nicholas looked like as far as his family was concerned, because at this point, they finally had him back. He had been missing for three years. They didn't care that he looked a little different. All they wanted was to bring him home. So because of that, Nicholas's sister, Carrie, was actually the one who flew over to Spain with a friend of hers to retrieve Nicholas. So Carrie flew out on October 14th, 1997, and she brought family pictures. She brought items that belonged to Nicholas to try and refamiliarize him with his family again and try to make him as comfortable as possible. Now, when Carrie first saw Nicholas, she was extremely ecstatic. However, he was definitely a little bit more closed off and a little quiet, but that wasn't really a shock to anyone. It honestly made sense that he would be like that considering the experiences that he had gone through. And Carrie basically attributed it to the fact that he had gone through a horrific trauma over the past three years that he had been missing and it was going to take some time for him to come around. But regardless, Nicholas and Carrie and the friend who went with Carrie ended up flying back to San Antonio so Nicholas could reunite with everyone. Now, because he was 13 years old when he went missing and now it was three years later and he was 16 years old, once he got back to San Antonio, Nicholas got re-enrolled in high school. He was taking classes again, and he was really trying to normalize his life again. No one was discrediting what he had been through or disregarding any of the trauma that he had, but everyone thought it was important for him to feel a sense of normalcy again. So he enrolled in high school. He had a group of friends. He had a crush on a girl in one of his classes, and for all things considered, he was really adjusting well back into his life. One thing that did change when Nicholas came back to San Antonio is that he moved out of his house with his mother. So he wasn't living with Beverly anymore. Instead, he was living with his older sister, Carrie, and he was sharing a room with Carrie's younger son. And the reason they did this is, again, because Beverly wasn't going to be able to give Nicholas that structure that he needed just as much as she wasn't when he went missing. She still had the graveyard shift job and everyone thought it was just in his best interest to have someone who could watch him more. Now, in the beginning, when Nicholas first returned back to San Antonio, his family was ecstatic, especially his immediate family and his extended family. Everyone was super thrilled. However, as months continued to pass, some of his extended family started to have a couple of questions. For example, how did Nicholas's eye color change? That was something that no one could really justify or come up with an answer for. Along with that, Nicholas's behavior when he came back was very cool, calm, and collected, and that was very different than the erratic behavior he had when he went missing. Some of Nicholas's extended family and the authorities said that they should do a DNA test just to 100% confirm that this was Nicholas. That way there would be no questions, there would be nothing that the family would have to worry about, but Nicholas's immediate family refused a DNA test. His mother did not want to do that, his sister didn't want that, no one else wanted that. Now, a couple months after Nicholas had been reunited with his family, there was a TV show called Hard Copy that had heard about Nicholas's story and they wanted to do a special on it because quite frankly, it was a remarkable story. So because of that, the TV show hired a private investigator named Charlie Parker to essentially go find Nicholas in San Antonio and interview him for this TV show. And when Charlie did find Nicholas, he ended up having a lot of questions. Now, Charlie didn't approach Nicholas automatically when he found him. He kind of blended into the background and honestly just did what a private investigator does, which meant he just wasn't really seen. He kind of just watched Nicholas for a little bit. And he, again, like I said, had a lot of questions. The first thing that Charlie noticed was Nicholas looked a lot older than 16 years old. And another question he had, which is something that we've mentioned multiple times at this point, is why did Nicholas have brown eyes? He had blue eyes when he went missing, and now all of a sudden he has brown eyes. And I know we keep bringing it up, but at the same time, it was something that no one could really justify. Now, something else that Charlie did was he decided he was going to compare the old Nicholas's ears to the new Nicholas's ears. And while that might seem a little bizarre, 
are to you, ears are a very defining feature and they're something that does not change. So if Nicholas's ears looked different before he went missing versus after he got rescued, then it was going to be very clear that this was not the real Nicholas. And once Charlie did that, it was very, very clear that these were two different set of ears, which in Charlie's mind meant that this was not Nicholas Barclay. And Charlie's first thought after he saw this was maybe Nicholas, the new Nicholas, quote unquote, was a spy. He thought that could be the only motive because why would anyone else try and be this missing boy? What would drive someone to want to take on that life and take on Nicholas's identity? Now, around the same time that Charlie was doing his own investigating on Nicholas, Nicholas's family also decided to send him to a psychiatrist because after all of the years of trauma, they figured it was best for Nicholas to try and talk to someone to talk through that trauma. And one of the first things that the psychiatrist noticed was Nicholas's accent. Nicholas spoke with a very distinct French accent. And this psychiatrist ended up telling Nicholas's family that it would literally be impossible for Nicholas to have a French accent. Science has actually proven that it is impossible for someone to pick up an accent after 12 years old. So Nicholas should not have had a heavy French accent. But when the psychiatrist told Nicholas's family this, they didn't seem super thrown off by it. They thought because he had been overseas for three years and in God knows what environment, that it was normal for him to have this accent, even after the psychiatrist said, that's not right. And because the family wasn't really listening to him, him, the psychiatrist ended up reaching out to the FBI and informed them that he did not believe that this was Nicholas Barclay, but in fact, he believed that it was an imposter. Now, after the FBI spoke with the psychiatrist, the FBI then reached out to Nicholas's family again. So this is now the second professional that is reaching out to this family to say, hey, something doesn't seem right here. This doesn't seem like this is adding up. But again, the family just shrugged it off, which the FBI found incredibly concerning because wouldn't you want to know 100% whether this was your son who had gone missing or a stranger that you're now letting live in your house. So because of that, the FBI ended up obtaining warrants for blood and fingerprint samples of both Beverly and the new Nicholas. That way they could see if they were a match. And according to the FBI, Beverly did put up quite a bit of a fight when she found out she had to give her DNA. She did not want to do it. And the FBI said that she actually threw herself on the floor while Beverly said that never happened. So very much he said, she said in that situation. Situation, we don't know which one is correct. Now, on March 3rd, 1998, the FBI got a call from authorities in Madrid, Spain, and told them that they had a match on the fingerprints. And on that same day, Charlie was actually following Nicholas around to try and get some more information on him. And ultimately on that day, Charlie was able to sit down with Nicholas. He got Nicholas to agree to sit down with him at this diner and they ordered hotcakes. And Charlie said that he remembers this clear as day. They ordered the hot cakes and they started talking and eating and Charlie mentioned something to Nicholas about his mother, Beverly. And that is when Nicholas looked at Charlie and said, quote unquote, she's not my mother and you know it. Now, when Charlie heard that, he said his jaw literally dropped to the floor because it's one thing to have suspicions and to think one thing, but it's another thing to get confirmation. So after Nicholas, quote unquote, said that he wasn't Nicholas, Charlie's next question then was to ask him who he really was. And that is when Charlie learned that this new Nicholas was actually a man named Frederick Borden. And that is when it was confirmed that this new Nicholas was in fact an imposter. So let's talk about Frederick. Now, Frederick was not 16 years old as he was claiming or as he was trying to pass for, but instead he was actually 23. So he was 23 years old pretending to be 16 years old. Now, weirdly enough, Frederick was born on June 13th, 1974, and June 13th is the day that the real Nicholas went 
missing. Frederick was raised by his grandparents in France before eventually running away to Paris, which explains the French accent. Frederick's mother was 17 years old when she had him, and his father was a much older man from Nigeria. And according to Frederick, his grandfather was extremely racist. And when he found out that his daughter got pregnant by an Algerian man, he wanted her to abort Frederick. So according to him, he thought from a very young age that he never really belonged anywhere. Now, I watched a documentary called The Imposter on this whole case, and in this documentary, they interview Frederick himself, and I am going to point out some of the key things that Frederick said in this documentary. Now, according to Frederick, he said the number one most important thing this entire time that he was quote unquote Nicholas was to be convincing. He did everything he could to be as convincing as possible. He knew that in order for police to believe he was a child and not an adult, he would have to act like a child and not an adult. He said that he manipulated police into thinking he was a child because he acted scared. He said he acted in such a way where police would have had to believe that something was wrong and they would have to ask him specific questions as to what happened to him. Now, according to Frederick, the reason he ever did any of this impersonating to begin with was to receive the love and affection that he claims he never got as a child. He never knew who his biological father was and he ran away from his grandparents. And Frederick said that he knew that if he played his cards right, the authorities would have to put him in a children's home, which was his ultimate goal. And let me remind you, again, this man was 23 years old at this point, wanting to stay in a children's home. So I think it's fair to say that there is some sort of screw loose. But regardless of that, it actually worked because he was placed in a children's home after authorities found him, and he was incredibly happy but he wasn't done just yet. Now, over and over again, police would ask Frederick what his name was. And at this point, Frederick really didn't have a plan. He didn't know how he was going to stay in this children's home. So he just kept quiet the entire time. And every time police would ask him what his name was, he wouldn't say anything. When police asked him what happened to him, he wouldn't say anything until ultimately authorities threatened him by saying, if you don't tell us what your name is, and if you don't tell us what happened to you, we are going to take pictures of you and get your DNA, and we ultimately will find out who you really are. So because of that, Frederick knew that he had to come up with a plan. Frederick told authorities that he was an American that had ran away. He said that he would contact his family in America, but that he wanted to do it by himself. So he wanted to be in a room alone when he did it, which ironically authorities allowed. Now, when Nicholas was left alone, he called the American authorities all across the country and told each one of them that he was a police officer from Spain and they had found a kid who had gone missing in America. He went on to say that this kid had been missing for about three years, but they didn't know his identity. And after talking to several different police stations, across the entire country, Frederick then called the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and he got on the phone with an operator. He explained the whole thing again, how they had this kid who was around 14 to 15 years old. He had been missing for about three years, and they were trying to find his identity. And he also went on to describe some characteristics that he had to try and give some more distinguishing factors to see if there was any missing persons profile that he would kind of follow into. And that is when the operator told Frederick, who she thought was a police officer from Spain, that the boy that they had missing could possibly be a boy from San Antonio, Texas, who went missing three years ago, Nicholas Barclay. Frederick asked the operator to send over pictures of Nicholas, which she did. And once Frederick saw the pictures, he realized that Nicholas had been gone long enough that he believed that he could actually pull this off. Now, Frederick said that when he heard that Carrie was coming to Spain to retrieve him and bring him back to San Antonio, he finally started to realize how serious 
this whole thing had become. And it started to really set in with him and he knew he had to prepare. So in order to do that, he tried to make himself look as much like Nicholas as possible. He ended up dyeing his hair blonde and he even got the same tattoos that Nicholas had. He ended up getting them tattooed by another child who lived in this child home. And Frederick said that when Carrie finally did see him for the first time, she didn't even question whether or not it was him. He said he was able to pass off to everyone that he was Nicholas, and he quickly realized once he got to San Antonio how deep this was and how he had gotten himself to a point of no return, which I will say is a little bizarre to say because obviously if you're pretending to be a missing child who has now been found three years later, of course it's going to be serious. Of course this is going to be taken seriously by the family and the friends and authorities. If you're impersonating a missing child, people are going to take you seriously. So I thought it was a little bizarre that he was so thrown off by that fact. Now, when Frederick first reunited with Beverly and Beverly thought he was Nicholas, Beverly said that when she first saw him, she wanted to run up and hug him. However, his demeanor was very shy and standoffish. So she refrained from giving him a hug and just kind of held his hand instead. And Frederick said that the reason for that was because he doesn't like when people touch him. And that was really the only reason he didn't give anyone a hug. So what Nicholas's family attested as just a trauma response and not wanting to be touched, it was actually just Frederick's own personal preference of not liking people touching him. Now, Frederick pretending to be Nicholas did open up to the FBI and authorities about the sex trafficking ring. And he had to do this in order to pass as a US citizen and to prove to the government that he was Nicholas Barclay. They didn't just let him in and say, here you go, here's your new passport and everything. He did have to go through a series of interviews to confirm that he was Nicholas. And by some fluke, he passed each time. Frederick made up all these stories about what he as Nicholas had gone through. He said that in the sex trafficking ring, his hands were broken by baseball bats. He said that he was repeatedly raped and forced to eat insects and that needles were put into his eyes, which is part of the reason his eyes were brown now. And he was manipulated using military scare tactics. But this was all made up. Now, once this case started to get more media attention, Frederick really used that to his advantage. In his words, he said that he agreed to do all these media interviews in order to make Nicholas seem more real. If he was to go out and tell his story to the media and pass off as Nicholas, then more likely than not, no one was going to question whether or not this was the real Nicholas. Now, what's ironic here is that the entire time that Frederick was passing off as Nicholas, which was about four-ish months, his extended family as well as authorities were very suspicious on whether or not this was in fact the real Nicholas. But they weren't the only ones that were suspicious because once Frederick heard that Beverly refused to get a DNA sample of her and this new Nicholas in order to confirm it being a match, Frederick himself started to get suspicious about the whole thing. And he said that in that moment, he realized that the Barclay family, meaning Beverly and his siblings, probably knew that Frederick was not the real Nicholas, but didn't want to believe it and weren't showing it. And I will explain more on what I mean by that in a moment. Now, once Frederick's true identity was revealed, he was arrested and sentenced to six years in prison for perjury and passport fraud, but he didn't stop there. After he was released from prison, he was returned to France in 2003, and that is when he then moved on to steal the identity of another 13-year-old boy who had gone missing in 1996, a boy named Leo Bali. And in August 2004, he did it again in Spain, claiming to be a teenager named Ruben Espinoza, whose mother was killed in the Madrid bomb attacks. And when police found this out, they then shipped Frederick back to Spain. And in June 2005, he then claimed to be Francisco Hernandez Fernandez, who was a 15-year-old Spanish 
orphan. And again, in 2005, Frederick was close to 30 years old, trying to pass off as a 15-year-old boy. Now, what we do know about Frederick is that in 2007, he married a French woman named Isabel and had five children with her. However, according to a Facebook post he made in March 2017, his wife and children all left him, and the status of them is still unknown to this day. Now, what's frustrating about Nicholas's case is that when you research Nicholas Barclay, the majority of the information is about Frederick. And it makes sense to an extent because this is such a mind-blowing story. You had this French man trying to impersonate a 16-year-old boy and getting away with it for a decent period of time. However, Nicholas Barclay, the real Nicholas Barclay, still to this day, has never been found. We don't know what happened to him. We don't know if he ran away or if he was abducted. And so because we don't know to this day what happened to Nicholas, it leaves a lot of room for a lot of different theories. And we are going to talk about some of those theories. Now, when it comes to Charlie, the private investigator that we mentioned earlier, after he realized that Frederick was not actually the real Nicholas, it got him to start questioning what could have really happened to the real Nicholas. And when he started doing his own investigating, he saw a police report from that September night in 1994 after Jason had called authorities and stated that he saw Nicholas. He said he saw Nicholas try to break into the house, but when police got there, there was no sign that anyone tried to break into the house, and there certainly was not any sign of Nicholas. Now, according to Charlie, this raised up a lot of red flags for him because he said that this is something that happens a lot when people want everyone else to believe that the victim in question, in this case, Nicholas, is still alive. And so because of that thought that this could strictly be the Barclays way of trying to keep Nicholas's memory alive and to make people believe that he is still alive, it made Charlie question if what happened to Nicholas happened inside of his own home. And basically what that means is Charlie started to wonder if Nicholas was murdered by his own family. And this police report was kind of a distraction to make people believe that Nicholas was still out there and still alive. When in reality, the family knew the whole time that he wasn't. Charlie has said himself that he believes that Nicholas is buried in the backyard of his childhood home. And Frederick himself also has said that he believes that theory. Frederick has said, quote, I don't need to be Columbo to put two and two together. They killed him. Some of them did it. Some of them chose to ignore it, end quote. Frederick said that before he had this realization and before he realized in his mind that the family were the ones who hurt Nicholas, he said that he was not worried anymore of whether or not Nicholas was going to come back because that was his fear for a long time of what happens if Nicholas, the real Nicholas, does show up. Then my entire plan is foiled and I'm going to get arrested. But he said that once he realized that the family was actually the one responsible, he didn't have that fear anymore. And after his true identity was released, Frederick actually reached out to the San Antonio Police Department and told them that he believed that Nicholas's family killed him. And actually, based off of these allegations from both Charlie and Frederick and the evidence that police had at this point, a homicide investigation was opened for Nicholas and the family was investigated. Now, Frederick has claimed that Beverly specifically confessed to him that both her and Jason were the ones who murdered Nicholas and they, they hid the body. However, that is very much just hearsay and he said, she said, because Beverly is very adamant on the fact that she never said that. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that she would. Now, the reason that the FBI kind of believed this theory was because Beverly was so adamant against getting a DNA test for Frederick. Their whole belief was with the inconsistencies on whether or not this was Nicholas, for example, the eye color change, the fact that he looked older, he had a French accent, the fact that everyone was telling the family you should just double check and make sure. And Beverly was so against it and made the FBI feel like there had to be a reason that she was so against it. And there had to be a motive as to why she was so against it. And in their mind, that motive could have been that Beverly did know 
that Nicholas was murdered and she didn't know who this man was that just walked in through her door, but she kind of had to play the part of her thinking that it was Nicholas because if she didn't, then the real truth could have been exposed. Now, Beverly did agree to take a polygraph test and the first two times that she took the test, she did end up passing it. However, the third time she took the test, she flunked every single question that she was asked. Her answers were deceptive on absolutely everything, but she did pass the first two and she failed the third, which is another reason why polygraph tests aren't reliable in a court of law because they can be so inconsistent. So she passed the first two, but she failed the last one. So we don't really know what's true and what's not. Now, Nicholas's family completely denies any responsibility when it comes to having anything to do with Nicholas's disappearance. And Beverly has had a hard time believing that Nicholas willingly accepted a ride from a stranger on his walk home from the basketball court. She said that Nicholas was very street smart and he knew better than to get in the car with a stranger. Now, if Nicholas didn't accept a ride from a stranger, would it have been someone that he knew? I think the timing of the court date being the next day is extremely ironic. However, what I will say is that if Nicholas called Jason, because really all we have to go on is Jason's word that Nicholas did call him, he clearly had the intention of coming home and he only had $5 in his pocket. And according to Jason, when he was on the phone with Nicholas, there was no outburst, there was no argument. Nicholas seemed completely fine. So it does seem odd that he would just randomly run away like that. Now, I do want to say that Jason, Nicholas's older brother, unfortunately has passed away at this point. So he is not here to defend himself or say his side of the story. However, according to the FBI, when Jason was alive, he was very reluctant and hostile to help in Nicholas's disappearance, and he really just refused to help in any way way. Now, according to Carrie, Nicholas's sister, she says that because Jason died, he's kind of been used as the scapegoat in this case, meaning that people are kind of blaming Jason for this whole thing because he's an easy target, because he's not here anymore to defend himself. So I just wanted to point that out as well. But that, you guys, is really the case of Nicholas Barclay. And again, we don't know what happened to him to this day. I will say Charlie, the private investigator, has revisited Nicholas's childhood home where there are new owners who live in the home at this point. And according to the new owner, and this was all in the documentary, according to the new owner, when he first moved in, there was some sort of a plastic tarp that was dug underneath the ground. And the new owner's dog was kind of going at it and was digging and trying to dig it up and trying to bite it, but he was never able to pull it up. Now, there is no information out there as to whether or not the tarp has ever been pulled up or what is underneath the tarp or what was in the tarp, but I do think that if it was Nicholas that was in the tarp, we would know that by now. But I am very interested to see what you guys have to say about this case, so please let me know what you think. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube. I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode, make sure you tune in next week where we are going to talk about the case of Charlie Brand. This is going to be one of those cases that I know is going to frustrate the hell out of you guys, and I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about it. So I'll see you next week.